Guys, uh, we're gonna start in one minute, so please take a seat. And uh, yeah, you will have chance to have good networking afterwards. And yeah, let's let's listen for your talks first. One minute, and then we'll start. Okay, let's start. Uh, hello, guys. Hi, 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 everyone. Uh, welcome to the Cross Chain Builders Meetup. I would say it's like the first Cross Chain Builders Meetup because uh, together with partners, we decided to um, make some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, event in all the European countries. So this is kind of the first one. Huge, huge thanks to the partners of the meetup. It's the bridge. Uh, Alex is gonna present here. It's Aurora. Alex is gonna present right now. Yeah, it's Halborn. I don't see Steven actually, but yeah, Halborn also. Huge thanks for the support and Agnosis Chain. Yeah, uh, let's give an applause. Yeah. Uh, Alex is gonna present the first. Uh, take your microphones here. <laughs> yeah, and let's start. Hello, everybody. How was the first day of ECC? Nice. <laughs> hot. Pretty hot, yeah. Yeah, what was the best talk today that you heard? Okay, okay, okay. So, how many talks have you heard today? You can, you can just raise the, the amount of uh, fingers. Okay, five? Okay, five, five is the winner. Okay, great. So that's, that's impressive. I actually heard one, uh, uh, but now I'm going to drastically increase this amount during this meetup. <clears throat> so hopefully you're going to have fun. I will try to be um, pretty sticking to the, um, to the kind of details and technical stuff. Because as far as I understand, mostly we have here pretty technical people. Who, who, is actually, who are actually developers or in general engineers here? Can you raise the... Okay, almost everyone. Who are, you know, kind of more on the high level, on the business side or marketing or whatever? Okay, so some engineers are doing marketing. Great. Um, okay, cool. So, so my topic today is, is about MEV and how MEV um, a, can be useful for bridges. Uh, does everybody know what, it, what MEV is? Okay, can someone, you know, put it, uh, put it in kind of a couple of words? Uh, sorry? Like a super short explanation, what, what the heck is the freaking MEV? Minor extraction value. Minor extraction value. Yep. Or minimum extraction value, or maximum extraction value. People, you know, do. Yep. Okay. So pretty, pretty good explanation. So Ethereum miners taking into account that they have an ability to order transactions in the block. They're capable of extracting some additional value. And actually, there are some specific API developed in a very particular Ethereum uh, node implementations that give you an ability actually to, um, to, to tell to people, to tell to people that are searching, they're called searchers, right? To, to tell to people who are searching the opportunities for arbitrage in general, um, uh, they are able to submit to a particular API points of the miners 
the very specific transactions that literally mean the following. If you are going to put this transaction right after this particular transaction that is there in the, in the pool, then I'm going to pay you some amount of money. And the reason why some people are willing to submit such transactions is because the first transaction, the actual transaction that they are referring to, is introducing some kind of disbalance in the, in the pools and in the prices. So it creates an arbitrage opportunity, and then this arbitrage opportunity can be resolved. So for example, imagine a kind of user, pretty stupid one, that is, for example, not using a, um, uh, a that is using just a single uh, DEX, that is not using an aggregator, right, for, for doing a swap. And he's doing a swap of a size of uh, 1 million on the pool of the size of 10 million. So he creates an, an insane arbitrage opportunity. And somebody can buy the other token on the other exchange, or maybe several of them, and actually then sell here and instantly get, uh, get the value out of it. These opportunities are not only about arbitrage. There is in general some kind of opportunities. And uh, I recommend you to, to take a read of the a uh, pretty famous article at the moment, um, which is called Ethereum is a Dark Forest, and there is a, an additional kind of uh, extension of this article. And uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, motive in this article is about the fact that there are lots of people, <clears throat> lots of bots, that are constantly monitoring what the heck is happening in the mempool. Because out of the Ethereum mempool, uh, people are capable of extracting, or just, just front-running of the transactions, people are capable of extracting tons of money. And all of this is because of MEV, because bots are capable of submitting the transactions and just saying that, hey, execute these transactions instead of this one, or execute, <coughs> execute it afterwards, or things like that. So. This is, MEV, this is what MEV is, and this is what MEV is about. Some people are saying that this is super bad uh, because like, it, it removes the value out of the ecosystem, so it's kind of not that cool. Others are saying that this is extremely bad because, uh, because users get front run or you can create so-called sandwich attacks um, on, on the users, especially on the big transfers. Um, uh, and, uh, well, I can tell you that uh, there is an alternative point of view on this. Um, and uh, sometimes MEV is actually capable of solving some pieces of your problems from the multi-chain world. So, uh, I'm the CEO of, uh, of Aurora Labs, the company that builds Aurora Protocol. Um, Aurora is, uh, um, is a, so it is not that big, right, and it's a little bit too, um, too, uh, too much light here. Can we actually turn off the light a little bit? Does anyone know how to do it? Okay. Can, neither can we can we turn off the, the light? Uh, why? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, while you're doing this, uh, just continuing just continuing about Aurora. So Aurora is an EVM solution and an and L2 to Ethereum that is working on top of Near. Our main idea of building Aurora was that um, uh, NEAR is the scalable protocol. Uh, it is already there. There is no need to replicate the good consensus, decentralized network of validators, uh, fast, like low transaction speeds and stuff like that. There is no need to do it. Instead, the only thing that is required is the runtime. And NEAR native runtime is different. NEAR native runtime is... Uh, Near native runtime is uh, is is it 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 its own uh, near virtual machine. So it is not EVM compatible, which means that people that already developed their solutions for Ethereum they are not capable of launching their applications there. So that's the problem. So um, so we have developed Aurora. It is a smart contract on top of near, but from the standpoint of an ordinary user, it is viewed as a separate chain, a separate. L2 that is working on top of Ethereum. Now, it obviously has a Web3 compatible interface or RPC, which means that all of the existing uh, tools uh, can connect 
to it. Tools that you love, like Remix, like Metamask, like other wallets, and like Etherscan, <laughs> and like many, many other things, great things from the Ethereum um, ecosystem. And uh, our base token is ETH, actually. So we are not forcing people to buy another token in order to uh, operate on our chain. Moreover, just recently we launched a product that is called Aurora Plus. Um, and this product is actually allowing for the people to get free transactions, um, a certain amount of free transactions. So, uh, and one additional part of the, um, of the solution that we have is the bridge, right? So here is the multi-chain story um, uh, comes into play. So we are the developers of the Rainbow Bridge. Uh, please raise your hands, uh, the ones who have tried Aurora or Rainbow Bridge. Okay, some people, some people did. Okay, great. So Rainbow Bridge, it is a trustless and generic bridge. And that's, this is, this is the main part that we are going to discuss here, right? And by saying trustless and permissionless bridge, I mean that anyone is capable of participating in this bridge and there is no such thing as a validator of the bridge. The way how we approached it is pretty unique and extremely complicated. I do not recommend anyone who is sane doing the same, the same thing, just reuse our code. <laughs> so. Um, and the reason, because, the reason why I'm saying this to you is because it is super, super, super complicated. So what we did is that we implemented near light client and Ethereum light client as smart contracts on the opposite chains. So near light client as a whole operates as a smart contract on Ethereum. And Ethereum light client, a super complicated piece of tech, operates as a smart contract on near. So these two smart contracts are working there. From time to time, we have an external services that are keeping these light clients in sync with the main chain. So we call the services relayers. And these relayers are just submitting blocks. So every 14 seconds, there is a transaction on near blockchain where our own relayer is taken freshly generated Ethereum block and sends it to the near, to, to the near blockchain, to the Ethereum light client of the Rainbow Bridge. And every four hours, we are sending the near block to the Ethereum. And anyone is capable of being a relayer because light client, the only thing that it does, it just verifies that the block was created according to the consensus rules of the chain. And one of the things that, that my team is taking care of right now is that we are ready for the merge because this is the change of the consensus. So if you are reading, a, you know, kind of short expressions of what do you need to do when the merge is going to happen, the first thing that is there is that you don't need to do anything. Well, this is not for my team, right? So I need to change everything because of this, because the consensus is changing. And a major part of our solution is Ethereum light client implemented on Near. Now, um, now, when you have this light client, there is a nice concept that follows it. Literally, we have a, a Near node operational on, inside of Ethereum, which means that in order to break Near, you need to break that node too, which means that you need to break Ethereum. So Ethereum is, uh, well, it is just some kind of L2 to near, right? It's, that's it, that's, that's, a, that's a description of what L2 is. And also Rainbow Bridge obviously makes the whole near an L2 to Ethereum to some, to some extent. And that is the reason why I'm saying that Aurora is an L2 to Ethereum because of the fact that Rainbow Bridge exists. Um, Okay, this, raise the hands who, who follows the, the logic. Okay, 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 not that bad. <clears throat> now, the complicated part of the solution is that transactions on near are super cheap and we are capable of including in a single transaction the whole verification of the Ethereum block. 
and uh, the cost of the relaying of the blocks uh, is around $2,000 per month if every Ethereum block is relayed to the, um, to the near blockchain. Now, the transactions in the other direction is much more complicated because the native cryptography in near protocol is not SEPC, so not SEPC signatures. It is uh, Edwards Curve 25519 signature, right? And Ethereum has not included in the list of the precompiles uh, uh, the precompile for checking the signatures, which means in order to check the signature of the validator of the near blockchain, we need to write a smart contract who is actually, which is actually checking this stuff. This smart contract is extremely complicated because like that's, that's a super, well, this kind of complicated setup. It has 1600 lines of code that were even not generated by human. It was generated by a program that was generated by a human on a very, very low level. It is an assembly code, literally, where you created a, a program that, that has written this to us. And that's one of the reasons why, why this is a super complicated thing, so, so please just reuse all of that stuff. <clears throat> now, but even with the best optimizations that you can do, you cannot fit the check of multiple signatures in a single Ethereum block. And that's the problem, right? So even without checks of the signatures, the, uh, all of the other validations from the near blockchain require around one and a half million Ethereum gas on the, on the, Ethereum, uh, on the Ethereum chain. And that's the problem. And one single, uh, one, single, um, uh, one single signature check requires uh, additional one and a half million. Taking into account that NIR has 100 validators already and this amount just grows, like we just cannot fit everything. That's why our approach right now is that for NIR to Ethereum kind of transfers or in general NIR to Ethereum interaction, uh, uh, this interaction is actually optimistic. And by saying optimistic, it means that uh, the logic of how Light Client is working is the following. Somebody submits a new block to the light client on the Ethereum site. This light client checks everything from this block, whether, whether the structure is correct, whether the validator list is correct according to the current near epoch and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and it assumes that all of the signatures that are provided are correct. They might not be correct, but all of the rest is checked. And then there is a special period, so this block is kept as untrusted. We are not yet trusting this block. But there are outside serv services that, are, that we call watchdogs that are actually checking whether this block uh, is in, in a good condition. And in case not, these watchdogs are submitting a challenge. And they're saying, okay, this signature is incorrect. Please check this signature. I'm going to pay for the gas for you checking this signature. In case the signature is in fact incorrect, then this block is discarded. And to be a relayer, to, be, to have an ability to send a block to the light client, you need to stake five ether. And then in case the watchdog challenges your block, then this amount of money is sent to the watchdog. So that's the economical reasoning to run a watchdog service. So, still following? More or less? Okay. Now that is, that is, the, that is the design decision that, is, that, is, that we needed to take because EIP-665 is not yet included in the protocol. And uh, uh, if anyone would like to support any of the EAPs to be added to the protocol, please vote for this. Because this is something that is stopping not only Rainbow Bridge or Near Team, this is, this is something that is stopping many, many different advanced blockchains uh, that are using great cryptography. Edwards Curve cryptography at the moment is one of the best existent. So uh, this is something that is stopping 
good integrations with, with such blockchains. Yeah, and now what can happen potentially in this setup? Remember, we are permissionless. Anyone can become a watchdog. There is no limitation. If you are, sorry, uh, sorry, not a watchdog. Anyone can become a, a relayer. Anyone can submit a block. You just need to stake five ether and then you can submit, right? So this opens a, a vector of attack, uh, which is quite straightforward. You just uh, fabricate the block as if you are removing the liquidity from near and you're trying to release the liquidity on the Ethereum side. And uh, yeah, potentially somebody can, can hack it. Right. So we've got an attempt. We've got an attempt when it was one and a half billion worth of liquidity on, on the Rainbow Bridge. We've got an attempt of, of such an attack. So on 1st of, 1st of May, not very far away from now, still market was in much better condition. Um, so that's why it was one and a half billion of liquidity there. Uh, um, somebody was trying to do exactly what I just uh, what, exactly what I just described here. So he he just in a single transaction, he actually applied to be a relayer and submitted also just done. He he did two actions one one after another. He applied to be relayer, staked five ETH, and um, and sent the fabricated block to our RPC. Uh, sorry, not to RPC, to our um, New York Light client. And uh, what happened is that watchdogs immediately spotted that something is wrong, submitted the transaction, which is the challenge transaction, and then what happened was uh, something that was not working according to the, the thing that I was just explaining to you before, the bots that were monitoring the pool of unconfirmed transactions figured out that in case they are going to submit absolutely the same transaction but from the different address, then something is happening and this address is getting five ether, right? That's kind of a sweet deal. You just send the same transaction, sign it from the different address, pay more gas, get it executed, and uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of great. And that transaction was immediately front-run. Immediately. Within seconds, the attack was mitigated automatically. The attack on all of the liquidity that is in the bridge. And potentially, not only the, oh, not only the, the tokens, because uh, Rainbow Bridge is, uh, is a generic bridge. So maybe, maybe the, the person is actually was sending some kind of invalid message, for example. So, um, so that, that is the thing that, that was happening and um, kind of, well, good thing that it happened, that, that the attack was mitigated, but something is not working right, right? Because watchdogs didn't get anything. So uh, we actually were thinking about this issue and we were expecting that this is something that is going to happen uh, beforehand, more than half a year before the attack actually. And we decided to keep the design of this, uh, the design of this part of the, of the bridge absolutely the same as it was, with one small exception. We decided that it is going to be only a half of the stake that is going to be sent to the, to the person who actually submits a challenge transaction. And obviously we expect this to be an MEV bot because uh, ordinary people are, are incapable of competing with these MEV bots, right? Or ordinary s scripts that we, that, we, that we create. Another part should be manually transferred to the, um, to the, to the owner or to the, to the person who actually submitted the transaction that was front run. And we are capable of figuring out who it was because typically this transaction fails pretty fast, which means that miners are actually including these transactions in the same block, right? There is no point in not doing this, especially because the watchdog script works that it just sends a transaction with the gas price that is twice bigger than the gas price, uh, than the current gas price in the Ethereum blockchain. Kind of cool, right? So in order just to 
make sure that we are paying something to the MEV bots. We're just sending half of the half of the stake, and another half is going. It is going to be manually transferred to to the actual watchdog that was submitting this. The, and the proof of the fact that he submitted this transaction would be just the fact that his transaction is failed. It is the same challenge transaction executed at the same block. Now the question is, why the heck do we need to include here MEV bots? Because the design solution here might be different. For example, watchdogs need to apply to be a watchdog. Then maybe 10 blocks past this moment in time, they would, would be able to submit challenges. And then MEV is going to be discarded. But we decided intentionally not to do this. And the reason is very, very simple. In case there is an attack on your permissionless and trustless protocol in general, and uh, kinda with optimistic assumptions, the only thing that helps you to mitigate this attack or resist this attack is quick reaction. In our case, quick reaction window is four hours, right? Uh, it's just because we want it to be on the, on the safe side, make sure that you know, the systems can work. But still, four hours, that's, that's, that's kind of a, a lot from one side. From the other side, it is not enough in case everybody are sleeping, right? Uh, or everybody are on some kind of conference in Paris, right? Or something like that. So, uh, so it is not that big. So it means that these automatical systems need to figure out the situation. And what is the best system that can submit a transaction to the blockchain? It is MEV bots, surprisingly. So they are not only bad guys, but these people figured out how to, super efficiently figured out how to actually submit transactions to the blockchain. And for the optimistic permissionless protocols, it is insanely important to get transactions executed in order to mitigate these attacks. So, uh, yeah, I literally was covering some portions of the slide. I uh, just wanted to say to everybody that in case you are willing to participate and in case you are using Aurora, in case you are using Rainbow Bridge, you can easily improve the security of the Rainbow Bridge by running a watchdog service. It costs around five bucks a month. So for, for the majority of people who are, who are bridging their uh, funds to Aurora um, or, or to Near. Uh, this is uh, this is not a very big uh, cost. This script is not requiring anything like nothing, n n no no you know complicated things. It's just from time to time, once per ten minutes, actually checking what are the blocks, what is the state of the contract uh, on, on Near like client on, on Ethereum, what is and checking whether whether the the block is correct or not. Um, besides the application that I was describing here with the just using the fact that uh, MEV bots are just uh, super proficient in, in, in sending the and in executing the transactions on the blockchain, besides that they are actually doing some additional great things. So uh, in case, in case the, uh, somehow the, the network and this is kind of more on the Aurora side, right? In case the network can stabilize the MEV activity and instead of directing the value to the miners of the protocol, direct the value that is extracted from the MEV attacks to the users, then this is going to be super cool. At the current Ethereum landscape, 90 seven percent of the value that is extracted from these opportunities is is forwarded towards the the miners this is how the Pareto equilibrium is working in ethereum at the moment and from some kind of some kind of point of view it is not that good because uh, this is the value that is extracted from the ecosystem and maybe just users are uh, they were like not thinking that that, that, that uh, you know they are going to do kind of bad transaction and what can be designed is that on the protocol level, on the level of the chain, you can create an ability 
to, for, the, uh, for these arbitrages and these MEV bots to connect directly to the chain while given, given for them also an ability to do the auction while the, the, these, these profits or this, 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 this value that they are paying back is actually transferred not to the miners but rather back to the user who is sending the transaction. So this is kind of advanced, advanced thing. Yeah, so um, I'm just saying to everybody that there are many, many good things in, in, in MEV, so just don't hate it, uh, uh, but uh, also uh, kind of find some good things out of it. And uh, let's build secure apps. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Um, so yeah, uh, I believe you have guys a lot of questions, but uh, we are... Yeah, sorry for of, taking more yeah, time. It's okay, it's okay. Like, um, I think that it would be better. We're going to have a panel discussion with all of our speakers and you're going to have a chance to... No worries. Uh, and you're going to have a chance to ask your questions and uh, moreover, like, speakers are here. We're going to have a huge networking se session afterwards. So yeah, feel free to come to Alex and ask your question. The next speaker is Alex from Debridge. Let's give an applause. Yeah, Alex is a co-founder and CEO of, of Debridge. Right, guys so Alex is ready to present I would ask you for everyone who is sitting here just to move a little bit like that because people are coming they are not like able to sit yes we're gonna have an also a space upstairs for the networking so if you're going to speak between each other uh, super loud I recommend you to go upstairs there are gonna be some food soon yeah, uh, this is not real food. We're going to have food soon upstairs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, all right, so Alex, are you ready? And I give a word to you. One, two, three. OK, perfect. Hey, Thank guys. You. Hi, everyone. Hope you had a really great first day of the ECC. So yeah, my name is Alex Smirnov. I'm CEO and co-founder at DeepBridge. And today we're going to talk about the cross-chain applications and in general, like about the secure interoperability layer of Web3. So that's basically what we are building within like Debridge team. And uh, yeah, so basically like cross-chain topic is quite hot currently, even at the current state of the market, because like everyone's saying that we already are living in the multi-chain world. And like right now we have like more than 50 different blockchains, right? And uh, many of those are just like forks of Ethereum. Many of those are EVM compatible. At the same time, we have like quite new, newly designed and like unique ecosystems which are based like on a different set of like programming languages such as Rust. And of course, in order to maximal like cap capital efficiency, there is a clear need for cross-chain infrastructure. And uh, in general, right now we have around like $100 billion of value distributed across more than 50 blockchains. And uh, to maximize capital efficiency and to build truly efficient applications, we should have the interoperability layer. Because the overall user experience right now, like for a regular Web2 user, he, he would say like that, it's a nightmare. Because right now, people who interact with the decentralized applications have to like switch wallets, switch networks, understand what kind of bridge should be used to transfer liquidity from one specific chain to another. So in overall, that's like super complicated process. And that's not how it should work, especially in a case if you want to onboard the next billion users into, into crypto and DeFi. So, and that's not only for transfer of liquidity, it's like interoperability is needed for cross-chain intercommunication. And the lack of the decentralized standards leads to certain fragmentation issues. That's like fragmentation of technologies, 
basically we see many blockchain ecosystems, for example, like EVM compatible chains, and many teams are doing the same thing, right? So many teams just like replicating Uniswap, many are trying to for curve, like DeFi protocols, lending protocols such as our and others. And yeah, basically like the overall effectiveness of the industry is not that big because like due to lack of the intercommunication, people are working on the same things instead of innovating. And of course, fragmentation of liquidity is another problem because there is no efficient way to like move freely liquidity from one chain to another. And um, one of the most powerful concepts of DeFi is composability. And uh, we all saw many great examples of composable applications. So basically, it's also called, called money legos. Like combining different DeFi primitives and protocols allows to receive or to implement way more capital efficient solutions. And we saw many examples, such as Aave and Maker, right? When MakerDAO could mint DAI directly into Aave protocol in order to have a limited interest rate on Aave borrowing. And that's quite interesting. So basically, like Maker can have additional revenue if the demand for DAI is too big at the same time that brings additional monetization channel for Aave. Another good example of compatibility is like UXD protocol and Mango, when the algorithmic stablecoin on Solana ecosystem can open delta neutral positions on perpetual markets in order to maintain its spec and at the same time to kind of connect, collect additional revenues from the delta neutral positions. And yeah, in general, like, there are way more examples of composable applications, for example, convex and curve, like one inch and different exchanges. And the problem is that all, like most of these money Legos are assembled within one specific ecosystem, right? Because like there is certain need to have like synchronous compatibility between smart contracts and there is no way to interconnect smart contracts that are deployed in different blockchains. But just imagine if we would have the way to pass arbitrary messages and call data between smart contracts. That would allow us to combine different DeFi primitives on a cross-chain scale. For example, we could have like algorithmic stablecoin protocol in Ethereum, like Frax, that can open up positions in perpetual markets in different chains and do it in a more efficient way, right? So for example, instead of like opening position on Mango, the protocol can pick what perpetual futures market provide the best interest and have like max, ma maximally efficient delta neutral position. Or let's imagine if Aave can open or interact with Mango markets on Solana, right? And this kind of DeFi primitives is what we will see in the near future. Because right now people still are building like within one specific ecosystem, but whenever you can combine smart contracts deployed in different chains, you can build way more interesting scenarios and primitives. So, and that's what basically we are building in Dbridge. Dbridge is like secure interoperability layer for Web3. It's a cross-chain generic messaging protocol and interoperability infrastructure that allows to transfer arbitrary messages and liquidity in the same transaction. So we provide a framework for developers and users to solve different cross-chain needs and to tap into various cross-chain opportunities. So basically developers can interconnect any smart contract on any chain by leveraging the decentralized cross-chain infrastructure. And it's working in the following way, like Dbridge protocol itself consists of two layers. There is a protocol layer, which is like a set of smart contracts that are deployed in every blockchain that we support. And there is an infrastructure layer, which is represented by the set of validators that are elected by Dbridge governance and validators work for Dbridge governance. So instead of implementing like light client, we have the validation layer. And in general, there is no way to build like generic messaging protocol without having validation layer, because that's possible to have like with light clients between two chains, but whenever you want to build some kind of generalized technology that allows data transfers between arbitrary chains, you got to have some kind of validation layer. And there, there are many ways to implement that. There can be like optimistic design, there can be validators that work for governance. So yeah, we already see like many different design decisions that are coming, but the point 
uh, that in DeepBridge we have like validators that are working for governance. And the only risk here is of course like what happens if validators will collude, right? If validators will like sign some transaction that will withdraw collateral from some protocol or like do some kind of like malicious message transfer. And uh, in order to prevent this, there is a delegated staking mechanism. So basically anyone is able to delegate liquidity for a validator in order to participate in the protocol revenue sharing. So if validator is doing something wrong, it's getting slashed. So slashing mechanism is playing like important part of the protocol design to prevent validators to get into collusion. And that's an addition to like general uh, approach to peak validators because all validators are like professional infrastructure providers who are validating many different chains and uh, yeah basically validators like run the full node of every supported blo blockchain alongside debridge node and uh, whenever user or like protocol performs cross-chain interaction or cross-chain message transfers debridge smart contract emits a, uh, an event and validators just listening for all events emitted by the smart contract and sign it with their like with their private key. And of course, like all identifiers of the cross-chain events are unique within like DeBridge protocol. Um, so yeah, and uh, really interesting thing about this kind of design is that like validators do not need to to broadcast any transactions on chain. What they do, validators only listen for events emitted by the smart contract, sign unique identifier and store signature into IPFS. So anyone who has like at least two thirds of signatures from validators can execute transaction on the destination chain. And this kind of design allows to also to have like unlimited throughput. And uh, I truly believe that like for cross-chain interoperability layer, there is no need to build your own blockchain. There is no need like to reinvent the wheel because even if you're building like your own blockchain, there is no way it will be, it will have a bigger throughput than all of the blockchains supported by the bridging technology. That's why like in DeBridge, I think that's quite unique design, design decision as well because like we have off-chain validation. So basically the only goal is to make like all validators signatures to be publicly available so that anyone can execute transaction on the destination chain. Um, so yeah, the protocol that we're building, like generic messaging protocol, is live since like February. We got more than 100,000 transactions from around 55,000 unique users, and uh, support seven EVM chains. So like developers and projects can easily transfer arbitrary data between users and smart contracts, or between smart contracts. Um, the main problem of bridging technologies is the lack of capital efficiency because like many many users or many people in the industry have some kind of wrong perception of what bridging technology is because originally all the bridges were created only for value transfers right so the main goal was to like lock asset on one blockchain receive the wrapped asset on another and then do a swap um, and yeah, historically, like all bridges were focused on retail users to allow transfer of liquidity from one chain to another. So basically performing the cross-chain swaps. But bridging is way more than that. First of all, bridging is about bridging of data or data and liquidity simultaneously. And uh, not only between users and protocols, but also between arbitrary protocols. When let's say protocol on Ethereum can bridge data and open position on the protocol in Solana or like in any other chains. But that's not enough actually. In order to effectively bridge, efficiently bridge data, there is a need to know who was the sender. So let's say if some smart contract do a cross-chain call, there is like the receiver receiving smart contract should know whether the sender of the message is trusted. It's like when we are sending on the, the message on Telegram, we know like who, who are the sender. Same, exactly same here. And um, this kind of design allows smart contracts to build some kind of um, decentralized interconnection when protocol in one blockchain can interact or know addresses 
like of the sending smart contracts from other chains. And another thing that is quite interesting is the execution of transaction on the destination chain. Because all cross-chain interactions consist of two, two, two transactions. The one which is initiated in the origin blockchain and the one that is executed on the destination chain. And on the original chain, the transaction is like initiated by user, but the question is who will execute transaction on the destination chain. So there should be some kind of crypto-economical design or incentive to have transaction executed. And uh, yeah, so the most interesting thing is like how to send messages, how to perform cross-chain interactions. And sending arbitrary message is like as simple as calling the send method of DeBridgeGate smart contract. So this method can be called by user or like by any arbitrary smart contract. And for example, as a builder, if you want to interconnect smart contracts in different chains, you can build a smart contract that, that performs certain logic in the original chain and then calling send method to send data or like result of the execution to another chain. And um, this is like how the overall design looks like. So there is a sender that can be your address or the smart contract that interacts with the DeBridgeGate smart contract. Then as soon as transaction is final, DeBridge infrastructure signs the identifier of transaction and it's getting executed on the destination chain. And uh, here we, we can see the set of parameters. So we can specify like token address, amount, ID of the receiving blockchain, etc. But the most important parameter here is the auto param structure because this structure allows to pass arbitrary message and also customize the execution flow. So yeah, on the destination chain, we have like call proxy, which just executes data passed to auto params uh, structure. And um, yeah, this is exactly how this structure looks like. So we have this execution fee and execution fee is the parameter that allows to have like crypto economical design. So for example, we don't want to claim transaction manually and we don't want to let user like to switch wallets, switch networks, because otherwise like user would need to have the native asset to pay for gas for execution. Instead of doing that, as a builder, you can specify execution fee to incentivize anyone to claim your transaction on the destination chain. So if execution fee exceeds the gas cost for keepers or for bots, then bots getting like economical incentive to complete your transaction. And um, there is like fallback address, that's like parameter, which is needed in case the transaction is getting reverted. So let's say to avoid like any kind of st stock of your liquidity, if transaction is reverted, all the funds or all, all the liquidity is being transferred to the fallback address. Data is the message itself, basically it's a call data, which will be executed on the destination chain. But very interesting thing here is the set of flags. So basically, for you as for developer, you can customize the execution flow of the transaction on the destination chain. For example, if like the flag number zero is passed, then the native asset ETH will be automatically unwrapped. Or another important parameter is like proxy with sender. As I mentioned, like ideally the receiving smart contract should know who was the sender. And uh, if the parameter is passed, then the, during the execution flow, uh, when like DeBridgeGate performed the claim through call proxy, the native sender, like address of the sender, as well as chain ID, is stored into the storage so that receiving address can kind of cross-validate that. Um, so yeah, that's a bit technical, but like uh, quite interesting if you will build uh, cross-chain applications and primitives, because these kind of settings allows to fully customize the execution flow of arbitrary cross-chain transactions. So for example, if the flag number one is specified, then transaction will always be uh, reverted if the external call fails. And that will help like, to reinitiate transaction on the destination chain. Um, yeah, but if we, if, if we think about like, overall interoperability, it's all about interconnecting smart contracts on different chains. So build, building cross-chain applications is actually way easier as it may seem to look. And uh, 
the only thing like developers need to do is to develop the smart contract in one chain that interact with, interacts with the debridge protocol and uh, in the destination chain infrastructure or debridge protocol will automatically interact with your receiving smart contract. So developers only need to build like two smart contracts. The sending one in the original blockchain and the receiving one in the destination chain. And that allows to transfer arbitrary value and messages simultaneously in the same transaction. Another interesting concept is actually the transaction bundling. So transaction bundling is a feature that allows to build any core complex cross-chain interactions in a single transaction. So the overall idea that the message which has been transferred from one chain to another can encode arbitrary set of transaction calls. Um, and of course, like additional flags should be specified for that. So for example, we can send the message which will execute the set of different transaction calls se se sequentially in the destination chain. And that's an interesting concept because if you have ever interacted with Agnosis Safe application, there is some feature which is called Transaction Builder, which allows to build complex interactions within one chain. And that, li that, li that library is quite unique. It was built like, by Gnosis Safe team, allows to like, pack arbitrary set of transaction calls together. And what we did in DeepBridge, we just, like, originally, we make our protocol fully compatible with existing DeFi ecosystem, and we integrated the DeepBridge smart contract with the Gnosis Safe multi-send library. And uh, interesting idea that we got to that, like, you can build arbitrary complex cross-chain interactions and pack it all in a single transaction. When, let's say, you can do a cross-chain swap plus stake resulting liquidity into Aave, or you can do a swap plus open position in some protocol. So it's all the matter of imagination, right? Um, and yeah, this kind of framework allows to build so-called DApps. We call DApp the applications that are built on top of DeBridge infrastructure. And there are many different uh, use cases. The first one, which is like most obvious one, is the cross-chain swaps. When you can do a swap from any asset on one chain to any asset on another. You just like as a user, you can specify chain from, any arbitrary token, you can specify the asset that you would like to receive. And all the magic will happen under the hood. And basically, this approach uh, allows to perform a swap between arbitrary liquid assets. And that became possible due to, for example, integration with one inch, because within every blockchain, like origin chain and destination chain, the swap is performed through one inch infrastructure, and the uh, user only needs to send one single transaction. So what, what we did with the DSwap, the solution for cross-chain swaps, we just interconnected one inch rotor smart contracts in different chains to pass message between one inch rotor smart contracts. And uh, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing here is that like users don't, or protocols don't need to have many liquidity pools. All the cross-chain swaps can be routed through one single intermediary asset. So for example, when, I use, when I'm swapping like, from Ethereum on, Ethe on Ethereum chain to like, USDC on Solana, my Ethereum will be swapped into USDC. And uh, on destination chain, I can swap from USDC to the destination asset. So there is no need to have like many, many different liquidity pools. Everything can be routed through just one intermediary asset. So yeah, that's, that's a cross-chain swap. Another example would be multi-chain governance because many protocols are deployed on Ethe Ethereum, but the problem of Ethereum is of course a gas cost. The transactions are quite expensive. Users are not that motivated to participate in governance because sometimes gas cost is like even bigger than the amount of tokens, value of token that they hold. And in order to enable kind of global governance, we, what we can do, we can create the governance votings in different chains, which are cheaper, for example, layer twos or like roll-ups and settle the result of governance voting in one specific chain. So let's say the voting can be performed in Avalanche or Arbitrum simultaneously, and as soon as voting is finished, the result is settled within, in Ethereum smart contract. 
The next uh, interesting application would be cross-chain lending. When let's say you provide liquidity to other protocol on Ethereum and to the same transaction, you can draw a credit from other protocol in Avalanche. And as a user, you will not need to think about like bridges, like what, how to switch blockchain, etc. Everything happens in a one single transaction. And cross-chain yield farming is another example. So probably everyone knows uh, Yearn, Yearn Finance. And Yearn is deployed in different chains. But just imagine if you can deploy or provide liquidity to Yearn on Ethereum, and then Yearn will automatically balance your liquidity between different strategies on different chains simultaneously. So you provide on Ethereum, and then Yearn distributes your provided liquidity across three blockchains simultaneously and rebalance this liquidity like leveraging the best APY from those strategies. And uh, yeah, DeFi sector is just like one, one of the potential sector of use cases. Of course, NFTs are getting more and more um, attention as well. And bridging of NFTs would be another application when you can freely transfer, let's say, your crypto bank and transfer it from from the one blockchain to, for example, Star Atlas, Metaverse, and use it as an avatar. Or maybe sell or buy the game assets directly from game interface in a single transaction. And yeah, there are many interesting use cases, but the overall idea that like NFTs can become composable and can be used between different like applications or smart contracts. And projects will be able to do, for example, a vampire attack when we are launching, let's say, some gamify project and we are saying to all these tapan users that they can bridge their sneakers nft sneakers to our metaverse to receive some additional perks or some additional like items within our specific game um, and uh, interoperability also changes the paradigm of how cross-chain applications are scaling up and ava is actually a good example ava is application that just started on one chain and then eventually like Right now, Ava is deployed across like seven different blockchains, right? And um, the, this type of strategy works for like 5% of all the applications. You, if you're building the protocol, you really need to deploy smart contract on many chains only in case you, your protocol is needed to have like synchronous compatibility with other smart contracts. And Ava is a good example because like we need to have like flash loans. We need to take a loan and execute some logic in, a, in the same transaction. But for 95% of the cases, you don't need to have your protocol deployed in many chains simultaneously. This is needed only for those protocols that represent the foundational layer of DeFi stack, such as lending protocols, DAXs, aggregators, or routers. Um, and I think that many DeFi and blockchain project will be gradually moving toward the application-centric approach when you just pick the blockchain that the best suits your needs in the best way. And then through the interoperability layer, your protocol will become available from any other chains. And uh, yeah, there, there is like specific set of parameters that may be considered when you pick the blockchains. The blockchain world to deploy on that can be like security throughput reliability or you can pick chain depending on whether it has like resolutions where your protocol needs to have with which your protocol needs to have synchronous uh, compatibility for example if you need a price feeds probably you would like to deploy on the protocol where like chain link oracles exist um, so yeah, this is basically the design of the application-centric approach. You just pick one blockchain, and your protocol immediately getting the synchronous compatibility with like other protocols as well as with users who have like UA wallets within this specific chain. But at the same time, through interoperability layer, you you receive the global accessibility. So users and protocols from all other chains can still interact with your protocols deployed on the chain like which you picked. And that can be even like application specific chains. For example, DYDX is building their own like Tendermint based blockchain within Cosmos ecosystem and they still can be, can be composable with the existing DeFi solutions and like general crypto ecosystem. Um, so yeah, why cross-chain? So whenever you deploy 
on one specific chain, you're getting unified liquidity, you're getting unified state, so state of your protocol is like, uh, exist in only one chain. And of course, unified UX, so users and protocols from any chains can still like interact with your solution. And the very interesting thing is that like, you can also leverage cross-chain interactions. This example is the one that we prepared integrating with Aave, when you can do a cross-chain swap, plus provide resulting liquidity into Aave in the same transaction. So let's say the Aave protocol is deployed on Avalanche, but I can still send transaction from BNB chain, and my BNB will be automatically converted into USDC, and on the destination chain, USDC is automatically supplied into Aave. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. So feel free to help us build the cross-chain future. We have like this set of tools, like documentation on how to get started building cross-chain applications. And I think right now it's like really great moment to build cross-chain because like many developers and users still underestimate on like how powerful the cross-chain applications can be. And who knows, maybe the next uh, bull market will be driven by cross-chain applications. So yeah, that's that's a good time to get started. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me as well if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, so also all the questions to Alex is um, probably right now during the networking outside or upstairs, yeah? And uh, during the panel discussion and the end of our... So by the way, you all guys have an agenda at your page, so feel free to check what is coming. And yeah, we're gonna have uh, some drinks and food soon upstairs. And yeah, the next speaker is from Halborn. Just give me one second. We need to update the presentation. Yes, this is a quick Okay, guys, take a seat again, and we're gonna continue. Okay, Steven is here. Um, yeah, uh, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, like, and then start the presentation. Thank you so much. Give an applause, guys. Thank you. All right, so uh, my name is Steven Walbro. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Halborn. We're a cybersecurity company, and you know, I wanted to thank you guys for inviting us to the Crosschain Builders Conference. Unfortunately, we're not the builders, we're the Crosschain Breakers. And, you know, there's, uh, there's, this is a very interesting topic to, to discuss because um, Halborn, we, we are partners and we secure a lot of the people that you're hearing from today, you know, Nier and Aurora and Alex, you know, from Dbridge just got off and we've been working with them for a very long time. So, on the plane ride over here, I'm from Miami, I was like, what the hell am I gonna talk about here and not throw somebody under the bus and not talk about a vulnerability you guys can read on like a Twitter space. So um, I wanted to discuss something that kind of impacts everybody here as we build. Um, and something that, you know, think of it as a warning. Has anybody seen The Big Short before? Yeah, The, the Big Short? Okay, yeah, it's about the 2008 financial crisis. Sorry. And, oh, much louder. I like that. Yeah, so uh, once again, who's seen the big short here? A few of you guys? Okay. So I turned 40 next week and I lived through it. I'm sure I'm like older than many people here. Um, but I wanted to talk about some similarities that have been bothering me and some risks around bridges. And, you know, this is not a bearish presentation, it's just something to, to think about. And a really good quote is that comes to mind is from Jurassic Park where uh, Ian, you know, Jeff Goldblum says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And these are a lot of patterns um, that are occurring again and again that yeah, I just wanted to, to say this as, a, you know, as we build, um, you know, to think about you know, the long-term effects of what we're doing to make sure that this ecosystem thrives. So this is the, the big stake and 
It's going to go through the risks, and they're not technical risks. This is going to be around uh, you know, financial risks and really the purpose of uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's going to go from staking to liquid staking to cross-chain staking. And this is something that nobody's been talking about. So, you know, we have uh, the, you guys know, like the Chad versus Melvin type of thing. So this is uh, going to be the Chad, the D, you know, going through degen levels and staking. So staking and locking an asset in an unreleased system with no launch date sometimes can happen. You know, so yeah, degen level one. Liquid staking. So now we're going to create a derivative of that asset that's staked, you know, inside of like something like ETH2. And, to, and you know, it's just being there, just validating, waiting. I could be making yield an APY on that. So let's make a derivative of that and, you know, earn some extra money while that asset is still earning, you know, validation rewards. Great, DGen level two. Now you've ascended cross-chain liquid staking. Let's mint a derivative of that derivative to earn money while the actual staked one is still on the chain, also earning money, and we have the derivative locked inside of a bridge, or a vault, or a validator, or whatever you want to call that. You've ascended to DGen level three. So here's the, uh, the Melvin. Uh, different levels of risk you know, involved in each of these. Yes, there's some profits, but this is about you know, the risk and the long-term think of what we're doing. So, yeah, stake medium risk. We've, we've seen how maybe there's uh, some risk on the project not actually releasing it. Um, we have high risk liquid staking, and we'll go through all these are, and then ludicrous risk on some of this. So let's start with the, the medium, and we'll talk about slashing, of course, you know, validators, you know, one similar on ETH2, that approved stake network. Uh, they can, yeah, you can lose your stake funds if you're not maintaining that validator, and it's not configured correctly, maybe it goes down, um, you're not validating a couple blocks, and you don't even know about it because you're not monitoring it, and your rewards go away. It's happened time and time again. So this is why we you know, put our money inside centralized systems to stake for us, because they know how to manage infrastructure, right? But they don't really know how to manage financial risk sometimes, uh, as we've seen quite recently with uh, some, some companies. So, yeah, no mercy. There's really no guarantee that uh, the staking protocol is error-free also. You know, there may be vulnerabilities in that itself. And uh, an example of this, uh, you know, I'm not going to read through all of it, and I'm not going to call out some of them, but this was um, a nice post on the GitHub of the ETH1 to ETH2 dev merge, where uh, they were having a conversation, uh, and the, you know, the, really, without reading through it, the translating it is, don't worry, we'll figure out a secure way to withdraw and move out the stake later. Just go ahead and merge it. <laughs> oh, wow. So... This is some of the things going on here, and uh, as investors, are you guys really reading into the GitHub comments about some things going on? No. So maybe we should be thinking about these things before we let people put money in it. So what the F is liquid staking? You know, he's asking for a friend. He's just the risk assessment. Allows for the owners of an asset, which lock, you know, let's say the ETH, in a protocol or network to effectively unstake that asset, and use it elsewhere. That's liquid staking. Nothing wrong with that. Yes, you might make some money with it, but you know, what's the risks with this? The long-term one, not the short-term one. Uh, our chat here is very interested in knowing how do I do that? Sounds interesting. So it's usually done through issuance of derivatives, you know, a tokenized version of that. And you know, this can be transferred, it can be stored, you know, something like ETH, and now you have your liquid, your staked ETH, and you can now invest that in something else, put it inside of a DeFi protocol. Okay, so, great, sounds like, sounds awesome. Sounds like double money, right? So, yeah, here's like a quick architecture diagram. We could see uh, over here, you know, you have your whatever protocol, whatever your layer one chain is, proof of stake chain, it's in there. You have some staking contracts and liquidity pools, that are allowing you to say, all right, well, we're going to check that here. And here's their liquid staking derivative asset. And make money here. Now I can also un have unstake and do some uh, you know, DeFi protocol uh, degening and earn some extra yield. Free money. Yes, that's right, Chad. It does look like double free money. So this is what it happens. Like, you know, it lets the owner maintain that liquidity and, and keep validating while they're just like, you know, waiting for ETH2 uh, you know, to, to happen eventually. 
Well, if you've seen The Big Short, you know, Michael Burry, as uh, our, our great actor here at Citation, says that it looks kind of familiar. So let's not talk about DeFi for a bit, let's talk about 2008 financial crisis and maybe some similarities and to think about, you know, not bearish, just some, some warnings because I lived through this. And a part, big part of that, if you know about what happened, there was these things called mortgage-backed securities where they put in some very uh, shady assets inside of there and, you know, it, it was created this like conglomerate of many different assets put in there, but all the crap is kind of there, the Django, yeah, Django puzzle. And, uh, you know, a lot of speculation led to that. So we have these different assets that all kind of like came together in, uh, you know, a perfect storm of complex financial models like, you know, CDOs uh, and mortgage-backed securities and, you know, synthetic assets that are derivatives like swaps and futures. Um, then, of course, use extra leverage on that. So hedge funds would come in and put, do that on margin. Uh, and then, of course, volatile collateral, um, like loans with high default risk. They're giving, like, you know, very large home loans with, you know, the interest rates there to, to high-risk people that would may not pay that off. So when you compare that to the DeFi, complex financial models, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, security, uh, the, complexity is the enemy of security. That's, that's the truth, I could, I could say that. I mean, it can be an amazing architecture. We like, I like complexity. Uh, it's a beautiful thing when it's controlled chaos. But complexity is the enemy of security. Um, synthetic assets, wrapped assets, liquid staking assets we're talking about. Leverage, so margin use on exchanges can be considered leverage. You know, we all, who's, I, I mean, I, I, I do it too, like whatever, so guilty. Um, and then volatile collateral. Is it's crypto volatile? I don't know. What's your peg, really? I suppose that. Plus unrealistic APY. Let's add a little salt to that. So you have pricing risk. You know, what if the liquid staking, you know, price of something like stake ETH, you know, becomes lower? Not, you know, not algorithmic stable coins, you know, that we, we know can happen there, but um, you know, due to withdrawal restrictions, uh, you know, it makes a real market making model impossible. Adoption risk, what if the protocol just forever is always being built and actually never comes out? This can, you know, f you know for, I, I love Ethereum, you know, but if, if ETH2 ever did fail, if we're almost there, but if it did fail to reach uh, you know, like required levels of adoption, then it could cause some type of financial impact. All right, so let's go on to the, the last layer uh, around here. Uh, what about cross-chain liquid staking? So now, this is not my final form. Allows for the owners of a proof-of-stake chain native asset that is locked to unstake it, then transfer that derivatives to a bridge into another blockchain with which will make a wrapped version on the other side while their token is locked in that bridge. Okay, let's visualize that a bit. Uh, and first, let's answer the question, of course, you know, we've ascended to that, must, must know more how. So, you know, we can read through this. Um, a great example of this is being, you know, the derivative token, the wrap token, and the liquid staking token. You know, they'll continue to receive the staking rewards, but they'll also be able to bridge it on a completely separate network in this multi-chain, cross-chain environment and get the wrapped version on the other side to invest it in getting some APY. So visualization of derivatives, you know, we have our you know, native, native token here, then we have our liquid staking token that's you know, you know, locked up in the bridge now because you've, you know, want to keep it there to redeem a redemption, and then you have your wrapped liquid staking token on the other side. So now here's, here's where our, our very <laughs> simple network looks like now, and you know, where can we find risk inside of this? We have proof of stake, we have, so we have this locked in validators, doing rewards. You have a smart contract, you know, that is creating the liquid staking derivative asset here. So a smart contract creating that derivative, then you're going to lock that inside of the cross-chain bridge here, so it's in a vault. And while it's in the vault, the other side is going to mint your derivative here, the wrap token, and then the wrap token is going to be here, so you can use it in whatever DeFi protocol on some chain. If any of those components fail or something goes wrong, like what often happens, we could be disconnected from like the native asset completely. The, you know, the core of what you what you're have is validating. So think about, I, my, I don't want to say, be, sound like a doomsayer. I just want 
you know, people to think about the risk of what's involved and what are we, you know, what are you creating? It can be done right. It can be done safe way, but sometimes greed can get in the way. Sometimes, you know, us as security auditors, we know, yes, we want to move fast and we want to build things. But when you move fast and break things, you know, people's money uh, gets lost. Or, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, my my co-founder, Rob, always says, all boats rise with the water, and we believe in that too. You know, it, if we think selfishly about, you know, doing quick and making lots of money right away, what's the long-term effects of that? You know, we've, this whole ecosystem has been burned many times. We, you know, with Terra, with what's going on with Celsius and all them, and in previous era, how, how many shots are, is it going to take until, you know, people start not believing anymore. I want it to happen, so let's think about that. Michael Burry says uh, this looks familiar to him again, too. So let's go back to the 2008 financial crisis again, and instead of looking at the derivatives part of it, of the mortgage-backed securities, the, the liquidity part. So what happened, you know, in hindsight, back then I didn't really know too much about it, I'm just, you know, whatever, you know, my, my dad's upset because his 401k is like really low. Now looking back, in summary, what happened was the counterparty risk became so great that the, with the mortgage-backed securities and the loans coming out, that they asked for more collateral to cover their margin so they wouldn't risk of getting defaulted. And the, the, you know, the liquidity providers, you could say, the dealers that finance it off the repo markets, they ended up just withdrawing, taking it out, and that was what was needed to make these markets, to redeem your options or you know, to get your swaps and collateral back. And without that there, the ability for anybody to exit those positions just completely evaporated. So it's kind of similar to, you know, what happens if the, our bridge gets cut off or there's a flaw in the contract. So you can see here the summary after the days of the outflows, the shrinking capital, you know, eventually Federal Reserve Bank lent $30 billion to Lehman Brothers and bailed them out and everything's happy again. Hasn't happened in DeFi yet, and I don't want it to happen. So, just wanted this to be for the builders out there to think about this. Because who's going to bail us out? I don't know. Maybe Sam Bank Freeman, you know, Sam. <laughs> That's DeFi, though. This is, De this is DeFi. So, let's hope we never have to find that out. Uh, all right, that's all I have. Sorry, guys, for. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just optimistic about this too. Just, you know, think of it as a warning. This is something just for everybody. Um, you know, we, we look at a lot of protocols and we, we're help, here to help secure you guys, but it's usually a lot of the technical risk. You know, the, the financial risks are not really thought about often. Um, so go off and, uh, you know, build amazing things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steven. Um, so yeah, we actually have 10 minutes for the questions. So um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, yes, no? One yeah. Um, no? Okay, yeah. Are you ready for the questions? Okay. Always. I love answering questions. My favorite thing. Hi. Um, so given in 2008 financial crisis, the role that insurance companies played in that as well, what are your thoughts on insurance in DeFi? Yeah. That's, it's a good point. Yeah. Insurance is always, I consider the last layer of defense in any hack. You, know, you do preventative things, you get audited, you do monitoring, you prevent things from happening. If all else fails, you have you know, Nexus Mutual. You have like, some type of insurance protocol to cover your loss. But what if the losses are so great that even the insurance protocols themselves may not be able to provide enough collateral for that? That's the risk there. In the financial crisis, you know, there was insurance protocols, but the insurance companies were involved in this as well. They were you know, taking all of the, uh, the different insurance coverages and the premiums that customers are paying and investing it into you know, capital markets and the things. So uh, they weren't the first uh, domino in the fall. So the bailout, the liquidity access just kind of got thrown into the market as a whole. When you have a cross chain, you have different capital in different networks. They're not all part of like the US treasury system. So you don't have that benefit of liquidity for everybody they're not all in the same you know we're all in the same system you know if you count out like forex where these are different networks so are they going to bail out you know this chain or this chain or this chain like whose whose fault was it was it the smart contract developers on this chain or was it the bridge owner on that side there's nobody really to uh, provide coverage for 
Um, so as a user, you're kind of screwed if, uh, in a worst case scenario. Uh, so if it gets large enough to fail, then you know, insurance could either, but that is usually the last line of defense. Okay, uh, so my question was, um, what do you think is the highest security level for a cross-chain bridge? You mean a, high, a platform? Well, well, in the, terms the, of architecture. Yeah, in the architecture, the I would say atomic swaps and just you know native assets. Um, when you have uh, wrapped wrapped assets, you know they can become a risk. The bridges, when you look at the bridges and it's acting as a vault, it's a single place that an adversary or a hacker can go to to steal funds from. You know, it's it is like a bank vault. So. You're not going to attack the end users. You're not going to go and you know try to get their MetaMask key and take their like you know three Shiba Inu coins. You're going to go for the vault. So they're targeted, and when you have that conduit as the only gateway out or in, then you know it's it's a risk for everybody. You know, so now you've added a single source of failure. I thought this was supposed to be decentralized. Uh, hello. So one uh, question from me, like you have mentioned about the risks, you know, that are involved uh, with all these taking, you know, platforms. Uh, like if we make sure that like the smart contracts, you know, are properly built and, you know, uh, properly audited, is it enough here to ensure the security or are there any other measures we need to take? It's a good question. Um, it's part of it. So there, there's no magic bullet for any security. You know, it's always defense in depth and you try to do as much coverage as you can on the different layers. So when you look at this you know, diagram again, you'll have smart contracts or programs you know, here and here. So you, if you do audits there, yes, you can protect maybe the liquidity pools that are, are minting and burning them, or you can you know, protect the uh, staking derivative assets. But you know, sometimes these bridges are running as nodes or even cent we've centralized systems like a AWS server running a MongoDB. You know, so that could be it. And there's not just vulnerability risk, there's liquidity risk. So if it gets, if all the funds get drained from there, then how are you going to swap back out? You're just going to mint, you know, this wrapped thing again and again. This is, this is what causes value to go down. And we've seen that with, you know, UST. So it's, you know, smart contracts, yes, it'll help support the system, but it's just one, one layer, which is, you know, at Halborn, we, we don't just do only a smart contract audit. We, try to look at it holistically, end to end. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes? Uh, how do you help the industry to make bridges more secure? I think it's more about, you. developers should be doing their own risk evaluation on you know, what are they building. Th this is something that you know, we can't do. It's you know, back to the second slide here. Ask yourself you know, this that. So we're all in a rush. We all want to get things out sometimes. You know, that's, that's one aspect is like security takes a while. It's very complicated and there's a lot at stake. And on the other side with what we're building, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> we should not be doing something, you know, along the lines of building a store of, of value, something that's holding a lot of value without you know, taking people's money and putting something in there before you even deployed or thought how you're going to let them take it out. So, you know, maybe take your time and just have a working full concept before you start putting, uh, you know, people's hard-earned money in that. All right, guys, any more questions? Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Me. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, the next speaker is from Gnosis Chain. We actually have like seven minutes, but let's do not have a break, okay? Like maybe we will have a break after you, Kirill, to set up a panel discussion, and then we go to the networking party. All right, um, one second. Okay. Okay, guys, Kirill, developer from Gnosis Chain, give applause. Hey, guys.
I hope you are not super tired already. Uh, so my name is Kirill Fidesev. I'm the developer and researcher at Gnosis Chain and Log Scout. Please grab one of our awesome t-shirts. Uh, so today we plan to discuss the way how we could make self-sustainable bridges in the cross-chain environments. So the plan for today is to cover what bridges do we have at Gnosis Chain, what are the typical costs for operating any kind of bridge in the cross-chain environment, and how bridges could eventually become financially sustainable, and what practical sway did we consider when doing so at the Gnosis Chain. So first of all, the Gnosis Chain is one of the proof of stake EVM side chains, with its main feature being that its native currency XDAI being packed to the DAI token, DAI ERC20 token available at the mainnet. It currently operates on top of two primary bridges deployed between mainnet and Gnosis Chain, which are XDAI Bridge and Omni Bridge. And of course, we also have some few useful and a lot of many in integrations with other third-party bridging solution providers like Hop Protocol, Connex Network, and others. So if you take a deeper look at what XDAI Bridge is and how it works, then actually XDAI Bridge is one of the oldest bridges available out there on the market. So soon it will turn into four years old. The way how it works is that it allows you to deposit some amount of native, some amount of DAI ERC20 tokens on the mainnet, and this will trigger the minting operation of the same amount of bridged XDAI coins which are native to the Gnosis chain, and you could also go backwards in the backward direction by burning some amount of native XDAI coins, which will trigger the withdrawal operation of the same amount of DAI ERC20s in the mainnet. So the XDAI bridge currently holds more than 50 million in DAI tokens of TVL, and has been secured by the network of oracles forming the multi-seq wallet. The Omni bridge went live almost two years ago, and its main feature is that it allows you to support any ERC20 token out of the box with zero configuration support required. It works in a similar way how XDAI bridge works in terms of deposits and withdrawals, so you can easily deposit any type of ERC20 on one side, which will trigger the minting operation of the bridged ERC20 representation on Gnosis chain, and you can go backwards the same as you do at XDAI Bridge. So as of today, we currently support more than 330 unique ERC20 tokens. The bridge holds more than 80 million of uh, USD stable coins in TVL and more than 130 million of TVL in other volatile assets. So now let's take a brief look what are the typical costs for operating the bridge today. So I try to come up with the, a short list as possible here. So the first main category is probably related somehow to the development and support costs. Of course, someone needs to pay the team wages. Someone needs to sponsor the security audits for the code base of the bridge. There is also usually some post-deployment maintenance associated with the bridge code base, which should be somehow sponsored and paid off. The second important category is related with the costs of infrastructure, which includes the hosting fees for all sorts and kinds of oracles, validators you have, maybe some user interfaces, monitoring solutions, and some bridges have some specific bridge explorers which we need to support and host somewhere. And this also could include the gas costs for transactions which are being sent for by our validators or oracles, automated when performing the necessary duties as part of bridging operations. And the last but not the least category of costs can be associated with the risks coverage. So this usually includes payments of some premiums to the insurance of locked assets for which we have some decentralized insurance protocols already out there. And this also includes the organization and payments in terms of bug bounty programs and something similar to them. If you take a look on the other side of the equation, then it's typically a big question how the bridge could try to compensate for those costs and how it could generate some revenue which will be higher than, than the amount of those costs so that the bridges could become financially sustainable. And in fact, in the earlier days of Ethereum, this was typically not considered as a big problem as just every deployed bridge out there followed the simple rule of this correspondence of one EVM chain to one particular bridge, 
And so each available bridge was just considered to be a small part of some larger parent EVM network, sidechain, whatever. And so no one just really thought about how the bridges could be financially sustainable as a singular product without looking at the budget of the larger one. But the today's situation is slightly different as there are now definitely more bridges available out there and their deployments than we have unique EVM networks. And so as more and more bridges are now being created independently of this idea of parent chains, more and more bridges have been created on top of other bridges, in between of our bridges. Then now it starts to make sense for bridge developers to start considering and finding and looking for different ways of achieving and generating some revenue streams. So let's now see what approaches we have related right at Gnosis Chain Bridges and how they performed. So far we tried three different approaches. So now we'll go just one by one and discuss briefly each of them. So the first and the most obvious approach is probably related with the bridging fees. So the idea here is simple is that similar to the way how any decentralized exchange works, we could just charge our users with a small fee on every their bridge operation. This approach works well and awesome, but there are a few things that make it way less efficient than it is in the decentralized exchanges. So the first problem here is related with the capital efficiency of the bridge. So the last time I checked the numbers at Gnosis Chain, the daily bridging volume was somewhere sitting somewhere around 3% of the entire TVL. And if we compare that number with decentralized exchanges, you'll see that this number is typically much higher. So the last time I saw at Uniswap, it was somewhere around 25%. So that definitely impacts the amount of fees you could potentially collect from your, from your bridge operation. And the second problem here is maybe kind of psychological one and is related to this idea that in decentralized exchanges, the fee, the taken fee can be thought as a kind of a hidden one. So as typically the send and received assets that user trades are completely different, they have a volatile exchange rate between them. And it's definitely hard for user to understand what is the actual amount of value he is paying in fee. And if you compare that to the way how it works in bridges, we'll see that the fee there is much more obvious as the send and received assets are typically the representation of the same thing. So, but to summarize, yeah, this idea is still doable and it can be used to generate some profit. From the risks point of view, you may see that this usually involves some slight increase in the governance involvement in the protocol. And from the point of view how it, it impacts the user experience, then as we already discussed, the users may consider such fees so somewhat intrusive and unattractive to them. And from our experience in the expected returns, the fees collected from the bridge and operation may just be enough to prevent possible denial of service attacks on, on the bridge transactions and possibly fully or partially cover the automatically sent transaction fees. The second approach we tried, which is a much more interesting approach, is related with the compounding of the idle capital. So the main idea here is that usually how any type of the bridge currently works is that it locks some amount of assets on one side of the bridge and then unlocks or means their bridge representation on the other side of the bridge. And this, as we already discussed, the locked bridge assets have a very low capital efficiency on their own if we compare the numbers with the ones we have in landed markets, in decentralized exchanges. And so this essentially means that a large fraction of our entire TVL the bridge currently holds becomes really some sort of an idle capital. And the main question here is that could we find some useful way how we could delegate the usage of such idle capital to some third party protocol, which could help us to efficiently and with low risks generate some additional yield, which we can record in our profit. So let's say if the daily volume of our bridge can be covered by just 3% of our bridge TV yield, this essentially means that the remaining 97% of the capital can be theoretically deployed to some third party protocol. So the easiest options here would be to just put these assets to compound finance to our protocol 
There is also such thing called die savings rate which is native to MakerDAO. So it's not currently in operation but this rate can be raised in the future if there is a need to do so. And the main idea here is that when and if our initially pre-allocated 3% buffer is being exhausted by spiking the withdrawals, then we could just seamlessly withdraw another 3% from the third party protocol and the bridge would continue to operate without any external interventions required. And as part of that, any generated interest that happens on top of the, our deployed capital can be just considered as a protocol profit and used to fund the bridge operation, the bridge costs and whatever we discussed earlier. From the risks point perspective here, definitely we should account for risks related with the counterparty protocol we choose and use. There is also a possibility of achieving the situation when there is an insufficient liquidity for instantaneous withdrawals when we are using some kind of lending markets. So this should also be somewhat accounted for. And from the point of view of user experience, we could say that some of the users may notice the increased cost costs for their transactions which may perform the seamless deposits and withdrawals from the lending market as part of this transaction. So this may impact the final gas costs. And some of the users also may struggle to understand how the funds are being used and so that kind of reduces the overall on-chain transparency on where and how the funds are being stored and transferred and so on. But in the end this approach so far is probably the best in terms of expected returns as you can easily receive the, this nice single digit API on the entire TVL of your bridge. So if you look at some numbers we achieved at the Gnosis chain. So since this solution was deployed in the October of last year, the entire TVL of stable coins in our bridges fluctuated somewhere around one to 200 million in stable coins. So which all of them were compounded in compounding and other protocols. And this essentially allowed our bridge to generate securely somewhere around two to 400,000 in profits throughout this month. So this included the profit in each of the stable coins plus some additional small rewards in the governance tokens which are regularly distributed to lenders and borrowers in compound and other protocols. The third and last approach we tried so far is related with the relayers. So as we already talked today, typically when completing some bridging operation, the users have to choose between either of two ways. So he can either execute some final transaction by himself and pay for the gas cost from his pocket. Or he could also ask some sort of third party relayer to execute these transactions on behalf of a user. And so if we decide to develop such kind of a relayer, then in order to make this relayer profitable, it just needs to take some fee from the user which should be larger than the expected gas cost of the same transaction. And there is also this nice way of ensuring that only profitable transactions for the real are being eventually included on chain, which is just by using the EMV bundles. So if we wrap the specifically crafted transaction at the EMV bundles, we can ensure that only profitable real transactions are being eventually mined and included in the Ethereum blocks. The way how we, we used this approach in Gnosis, on, Gnosis Chain Omnibridge was related with the custom integration with the Tornado Cash Nova application. So the way how Tornado Cash Nova privacy works and how it accounts for privacy of happening withdrawals is that they just should be executed from start, some sort of centralized and uniform relayer which will prevent leakage of private details of particular user. And so the way how it works in the UI is that users are free to set any relayer fee that they are willing and can potentially pay for the relayer which will execute their transactions. And after this withdrawal request has been submitted and processed by the relayer, it just waits until this fee gets high enough to cover the potential transaction costs, the minor priority payment, the direct minor payment that can happen within the MEV bundle. And once this fee becomes great enough, the relayer just generates signs and sends the necessary MEV bundle. And any remainder of this fee after subtracting all of these transaction costs 
we just count into this direct relayers profit. So the awesome thing about this approach is that it doesn't has any additional risk involved in the, its implementation. It also positively influences the overall user experience as the users now start to have more options for their transaction execution. This approach could also be thought as a form of organizing gasless transactions and it generally speed ups the user experience which is also always a good thing to have. So overall this approach can be thought as a very nice way of achieving risk free earnings basically for your bridging protocol. And if you look at some particular numbers we achieved at Gnosis Chain Omni Bridge with this integration then since it's launched uh, five months ago we have now seen that there are four independent relayers operating on those type of the bundles. They have already processed somewhere around 8,000 withdrawals from the Tornado Cash Node, which collected in total 125 ETH in total fees and uh, 32 ETH from those 125 were collected in pure release profit, which is a nice number. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill. Um, does anyone have any question to Kirill? Yeah? Thank you. Uh, do you do any risk assessment as for like how to deploy the, the locked funds into compound Ave? Like how much do you put in compound? How much you put in Ave? Like how do you do that if at all is like yeah, so on the slide I proposed that we could deploy 97% of the TVL because... No, but how, how, I mean, how do you distribute it among the different, the different protocols? Like how much do you put in compound compared to Aave, compared to other protocols maybe? So you could theoretically try to somewhere dynamically distribute this among several protocols, but the way it currently works is that as far as I remember, the DAI tokens have been compounded into compound and the USDC and USDC have been put into our just because at the time we designed this, typically the rates for those stable coins and those protocols were higher. So this could be, of course, changed and dynamically adjusted, but for now it works just in the simplest manner as possible. Okay. Um, any more questions? No? No? Okay. Thank you so much, Kirill, and thanks to Gnodish Chain for supporting this amazing event. Give it a plus. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And uh, so the plan is to have a panel discussion next, but uh, we have some cold drinks upstairs, which everybody needs, I believe, <laughs> right now. So I propose to have a short break before the panel discussion. Just go upstairs, grab some food, grab some drink, and go back. We will start at 9 p.m., okay? Thank you so much, guys.
Um, I think everyone's pretty familiar with who you guys are by now. Um, so, you know, we can kind of kick it off. So, um, you know, obviously, every, as we've discussed, we're, you know, in this multi-chain world, there's been this sort of Cambrian explosion of protocols in the last few years. Um, so, you know, let's start, like, kind of from first principles, I guess. Uh, maybe, Kirill, you can answer this one. Um, like, could you set the scene for bridges and the context for them? Um, and uh, the need, you know, paint the picture for the need for bridges. Kirill? Kirill? Ah, yeah, so could you just discuss, um, you know, kind of give some context as to where we've come from in terms of the need for bridges? Well, I guess the, the main thing about why the bridges are needed is because the, if there would be just one L1, then we are soon will reach its hard limit of the number of transactions it could process. There's also some different properties that can limit their, the usability of some particular chain. That's, uh, that's uh, like we are here because of the premise of the blockchain, right? We are in control. People are in control of their finance, uh, finances. People are in control of their voting power, of their identity and stuff like that, right? And uh, in case people are not able to move their assets or not able to interact with the applications on the other blockchains, which is de facto something that is happening here, then it means that something is not right. And that's why Bridges is a, a, like a super important part of the, of the current blockchain ecosystem. Of stablecoin USDC from one chain to another. And somebody needs to settle this cross-chain transfer. And who can settle it? With the current bridging models, it's settled from the liquidity pool of the bridge itself, right? And uh, the problem is that the, that the most bridges has, have like quite a lot of liquidity locked in there, but the utilization of its liquidity is just like one or two percent, right? Because like you cannot predict what amount of liquidity you need. And that's why I strongly believe in the concept of the compatibility of bridges with other protocols when bridges really will not need to have any kind of TVL or any liquidity pools, but will rather source liquidity from other protocols and DeFi primitives when it's really needed and do some kind of revenue sharing with those protocols. And I think that will help to kind of maximize the capital efficiency. And um, that's why probably in the kind of long run all the bridges focused on bringing TVL into their protocols will not survive just because their economy is not that sustainable. So we've, we've kind of set the scene and um, as for the, the need for bridges and the, the kind of context. So, um, you know, the often the sort of elephant in the room in, in conversation tends to be the security side when talking about bridges. Um, like Stephen, in, in kind of your experience uh, having done a lot of sort of time and research into this area, like what are some of the main challenges that you're seeing? Um, so the biggest challenge is, well, besides doing it securely, is trying to do it and, you know, keep it decentralized and not kind of gravitate towards making the bridge become centralized. Uh, because, you know, it's a lot easier to just, you know, monitor one chain, monitor another chain, and then write it into a database. Um, you know, now, now you have a centralized bridge. And the biggest challenge is, you know, you're creating, you know, like, like Alex just said, a one place with all that value it's, you know, that's what everybody's focus is going to be to, you know, uh, to, to steal that value. So biggest challenge is securing that bridge, making it work, keeping the capital efficiency on there, keeping track of the, uh, the ledgers as there is cross-chain there, and doing it in a decentralized way. If you can combine all of that into one solution, uh, then, you know, you've solved uh, a lot of the challenges there. But right, right now it's, um, it's very difficult to, to do that, as you guys, as you know, bridge developers know. And so, Igor, you've, you've, from what I understand, you spend a lot of time. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think we could go slightly deeper. Uh, so, for example, for now, we have a lot of heterogeneous blockchains, uh, like UTXO blockchains, like, like Bitcoin or uh, Cardano. We also have a lot of EVM chains, a lot of VASM chains, like Solana and Nier. And it's extremely hard to find uh, just one scalable way to 
yeah, to communicate between them. Uh, but we already have some solutions you know, like a tender mean for Cosmos or Substrate uh, for Polkadot or even like new Nomad thing for EVM chains. Uh, so yeah, we definitely could do something with it. Uh, and I think we also need uh, more on-chain light clients. So for now, uh, I think like the main solution is a uh, near uh, Aurora rain bridge to Ethereum. Uh, because they build a light client uh, for uh, yeah for near uh, on Ethereum, uh, and uh, to be honest, I think like uh, with optimistic rollups, uh, we could find even more ways to do the same thing. Yeah, for example, we have uh, new updates like uh, Optimism Bedrock and Arbitrum Nitro, who are working on a recreation of Go Ethereum on Ethereum. So I think it could give us even more opportunities to create a secure bridges. Um, can I also add something here? So uh, adding to, to what the previous person was, was saying, uh, I, I do believe that there is a solution that is going to be great for, for everybody. Um, it is a ZK light clients actually on the other chains, right? So, so you, you were telling about the light clients. So in case, uh, from my point of view, like there are two points here. In case there is an ability to create a zk light client uh, for a protocol, it should be created first, and second, it should be used on any other chains, and then this bridge with the zk light client should become a de facto standard bridge. And uh, slowly but surely, we are moving as an industry in this direction. And everybody who is working on on zk light clients, kudos to you. Uh, you are on the edge of the technology. Second thing that I want to add that in case there is a protocol for which it is unable to create ZK like client, this means that this protocol is shit. So, the, the, like li literally, because in case you cannot ZK stuff, it probably means that you cannot build stuff. And in case a protocol does not have a light client, um, probably it is not a, a proper blockchain. So, uh, but this is only my point of view. Were you going to add something? Yeah, I was going to say that kind of goes back to the first question about interoperability. That you know, zk technology could be the standard that you know we should follow so that we can operate together and have the benefits of each different project. You know, whether you're building something that is for privacy or something for financial or something for speed, you know, something for ga application gaming. But if there's something that everybody can come to consensus with among all of the different chains, then you know we're going to grow faster that way. So it's, it's kind of interesting how, it, you know, in crypto slash Web3, depending on your term of choice, um, there seem to be like these cyclical um, kind of arguments for like areas like, you know, there was the, the one where it was, you know, there were the ETH, ETH quote unquote, ETH maxis and, you know, Solana and, oh, you know, is Solana going to kill ETH and can the two coexist and everything? And, you know, there's also more recently seems to be this kind of like, can there be a cross-chain um, ecosystem? Um, so, like, maybe, um, maybe Kirill, you could address this one, um, like, if if you want to. Um, what, you know, how do you think like cross-chain infrastructure, like, can it be built securely? And you know, um, yeah, do you want to touch on that? Um, when it comes to security, I guess. The main problem is that the majority of currently existing bridges are based on this kind of approach of having a, some sort of multi-sig of validators and this approach has already proven itself that it's not very secure and we have these large hacks in different types of bridges in the recent months and years and so that's something that should be addressed somehow so that's one major point and the solution to it is this the research towards the bridges that are based on some sort of light clients, either on direct ones, optimistic, CK, whatever. And the second problem, largest problem, the security of the bridges is typically related with Web2 security, which everyone's typically forgot about. So the other part of, major part of all of these hacks in the bridges is related that with some compromise of the private keys, of the hosting, whatever so that just 
everyone is so focused on the Web3 security, they spend a lot of money on smart contract audits, but they just forget about the basic security considerations that are coming from the Web2 world. And so that's also just something that you should always keep in mind and not forget about. So this is a security topic, I can speak to that too. Um, I think what's, what I'm seeing happen is they're trying to force fit a solution for a gap that exists. And if you think of something like the, uh, the Ronin hack, you know, for Axie Affinity, where it's a game, so it's on Ethereum, but Ethereum's too slow. I mean, imagine playing an RPG, and it's like, swing your sword, waiting for the block to mine. Well, uh, okay, confirmed. <laughs> it's like, all right, you know, you can't really play a game that way through Ethereum, so they have to have a side chain in order to do it faster. So they're trying to, like, make up for these deficiencies um, in, with other solutions, and they're putting those solutions together in an insecure way. That's really, you know, if we could solve the interoperability problem, which you're there, and make the solutions work in harmony, then they'll be able to have something, you know, that kind of, you know, is form fit to every solution, like a, like a, like a game or a DeFi protocol. Um, Alex, Alex1, Alex2, anything, anything you'd like to add on this? So yeah, as regards to like overall security of the bridges and like especially hacks of like running and harmony, the main problem is that like everyone is trying to build their own bridge. And uh, I really have like two kind of advices that I, one of which I follow myself. So the rule number one is never build your own cryptography because you're not going to make up something unique, for sure. Like, everything already made, right? It's just like, use existing tools, use existing cryptography. Rule number two, never build your own bridge unless you're, like, fully focused, fully dedicated to this specific thing. Because, like, bridge, like building of bridges is not easy at all. And, like, many teams, they're thinking, okay, like, we are building our own roll-up or layer two, or we are, like, building our blockchain. Then, like, why don't we build a bridge? It's just a multi-seek. But like actually bridge like is a way more than just a multi-sig. And um, yeah, I was, I was quite surprised to see like that such a big like ecosystems with like hundred millions of dollars of value locked just had like multi-sig with like two out of four signatures so that like some kind of attackers managed to do efficient attacks on like PDF document and like retrieve a private key from one of the developers. So that, that's not how like bridges should be built and how bridges should work in general. So it's way more than multi-sig because like bridges are more or less as a middleware, right? And bridges have to rely on the underlying blockchains and they like utilize security models of the underlying chains. So very important kind of approach that every bridging technology should follow is to have the isolated security models of the supported blockchain ecosystems. Because we've seen quite a few have quite a few bounty paid. And for example, the guy Saurik received like $2 million bounty from Optimism because he managed to find a tech vector that allowed to mint arbitrary asset in Optimism chain. And just imagine if somebody like can mint the asset, let's say USDT, it basically can withdraw total value locked in all bridges in all other chains. You just mint like $10 billion of USDT and you start to transfer it through all the existing bridges that support optimism. And it's still a problem, still like most, like 95% of the existing bridges, they don't have these isolated security models. And if there is a critical vulnerability in one of the ecosystem that gonna like influence users and like protocols that rely on this bridge in all other chains. And of course liquidity providers who provide liquidity. So yeah, rule number one is like have is, is isolated security models. Rule number two like is to have various security measures laid into the protocol design itself. And for example, in DeBridge, we started to think about security even before we started to design the protocol, just to make sure that we have all security measures on the protocol level. For example, like validation of the state consistency. So basically validators always check the balance sheet so they know like how many tokens, for example, or state in the smart contract and compare the state on the smart contract with the state of DeBridge node. And if there is any deviation, they immediately stop validating transactions. And if, for example, like Wormhole had this kind of 
balance sheet validation, they wouldn't lose like $330 million back in February. So that's why I think that like it's really important to treat security seriously and not to perform just like audits. And that's very important and like we work closely with Halborn. So big, big shout out to Halborn for auditing the protocol. It's like we're really happy about this kind of partnership that we have. But in addition to audits and security bounties, it's very important to have like security measures in the protocol design itself. And that's what we are trying to follow like from the very beginning in Debridge as well. A short comment from my end. Uh, from my point of view, security is way, way bigger than just uh, designing your product. So you're trying to implement it, trying to unit test, you know, kind of do integration testing and then doing audits. Security is also about things that are more than that. It is about potential insurance for your protocol because the thing that you would like to, well, you cannot measure risks that you do not know. So there are very proficient people that are doing insurance specifically for these reasons. And there is, there is a last resort, which is the bounty programs, bug bounty programs. Because every hacker wants to come on a hangout and on the cocktail party tell everybody how they uh, kind of hacked some kind of protocol. But they cannot do it in case they cannot get any money to enter this cocktail party. So the, for, for the protocols that do not have bug bounty programs, in case there is an actual vulnerability that the hacker found, they, they literally go on to hack. They just do not have any other, uh, other alternative. So, um, and obviously it's super important to kind of measure your bug bounty uh, with the actual amount of liquidity or TVL that you have, right? So some of the big exchanges like have bug bounties of 10k on Immunify on on other kind of bug bounty platforms, and like it makes me laugh. So so this is this is also please do not do it as a check mark uh, in your list. Uh, tr please treat additional measures of security for your protocols. Yeah, both of you guys are talking about defense in depth. Uh, that's there, you can't just rely on one. Even whether it's auditing or bug bounty, you, like, you have to do both because there's, there's a big company, I won't say who their name is, they did only bug bounties. And what ended up happening was you had insider threats that would plant bugs in the code, tell their friend, like, hey, when this goes live, can you ha oh, here, here's the cheat code. <laughs> and then they collect their bounty. So now you have insider threat. So it's, you know, the very end result, the last resort of bug bounties or insurance, yes, all the way to, background checks on your developers and uh, you know make sure that they're not going to do crazy things like that but when you when you have a solution for all those layers from development to release and post release then that's really where you get the most security from that that defense in depth yeah you also can pay back bounties from the uh, incentives long term incentives of the developers right that also works great <laughs> Yeah, by the way, Alex has authority to kind of speak from the bug bounty perspective because Aurora paid one of the biggest ever bug bounties. And I wonder, how do you feel like when you pay like $6 million in bounty? How the like, process looks yeah, like? Yeah, we've paid uh, 6 million bug bounty uh, to a hacker who figured out the problem in the code that was in between the Rainbow Bridge and Aurora. And yes, when I was on the call, on that war room call we were figuring out is this an actual bug because we've got that submission through Immunify and we figured out that yes it is an actual bug. Um, the first thing that like I already understood that we need to pay but the first one to Obvi check one. Check. one. One, check, one, check, 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 check. Yeah, we lost. It got hacked. <laughs> we got rugged.
obviously it is pretty hard to pay to somebody six billion, <laughs> but it is much simpler yeah. than paying out to somebody half a billion. So I'm super glad that this guy from China, as we figured out, uh, pretty young guy, probably got quite a nice addition to his salary. <laughs> I'm super happy that the travel bridge remains unhacked, also because of the bad bounty program until now. It also sends a signal to like bad people, like, hey, just be a good guy, report it, and you'll still make money instead of doing something bad. Right. I mean, like, imagine all the cocktail, cocktail parties that this, this guy can come to and say to all the ladies, I just earned six million. <laughs> if he, in it's China, much better. If you in China. China. What you were helping to our imperialist enemies. Yeah. Uh, it is much better than trying to kind of clean up the money, you know, doing the laundry and have an insane reason that you are going to be caught. One, two, three. Yeah, now it works. Yep. So, that's it. Awesome. So, um, before we turn this cross chain builders meetup into a cross chain hackers meetup, um, let's, uh, let's finish with like a um, something on a a more uh, utopian note, maybe question for you, Igor, you know, you spend a lot of time analyzing data in the cross-chain space. What are some trends that you're seeing uh, that are encouraging and that you're excited about? Um, so yeah, I think like uh, if we talk about cross-chain space, uh, I think like, like definitely like the bridge guys, uh, the, yeah, doing a good work. Uh, the same about hope, to be honest. Uh, and for example, even like for uh, this arbitrum they say, I used only the bridge and hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, when I use hope, I still have some concerns about security because it's an ex Ethereum team and uh, they already almost had some incident uh, which was prevented by Sam Uh But yeah. I just know that uh, working on uh, any cross-chain protocol system, especially uh, on something uh, with a yeah with a me me messaging system, yeah like Connex for example, is really hard. Uh, and uh, I really like that we also see some new products like the Nomad X Optics thing for EVM chains because I think uh, it's definitely uh, much easier uh, yeah, to connect something with really similar uh, architecture. So I think we need to start with something which we already know and only after this try to work with all this heterogeneous blockchain world. Kirill, is there anything that you're particularly excited about? No? <laughs> <laughs> you're done. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, you know, thanks a lot, guys, for some, you know, very, like, thought-provoking answers. And, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for, for coming here tonight. Thank you, guys. And big thanks to Nadia for organizing the meetup. Yay. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Um, all right, so uh, is it okay for, like, any questions from the public or everybody tired? Okay, guys, do you have any questions to speakers about the topic? To someone concrete, okay. Yeah, maybe something about multi-compatibility. Multi like uh, exist EVM compatible chains, and now we have EVMOS. That's a uh, EVM compatible and Cosmos compatible, and uh, uh, this is the blockchain who is can be the. Uh, decentralized bridge that's connect Cosmos and Ethereum and maybe we can create kind of blockchain that will be like a multi compatible with all uh, networks that we are interested in uh, not to use bridge but to use kind of hub method or something like this um, so from my point of view um, the history is the best example and if we will take a look at the different operational systems there were lots of them developed uh, there literally two of them actually were getting the majority of the use cases you know, right Linux and MS DOS that was transferred into Windows later so so from that point of view I do believe that in terms of the virtual machines in terms of the runtimes the amount of runtimes 
that is going to be in the market is going to be very limited. So EVM for sure is there and is going to be and is going to stay forever because it is super simple, straightforward, and literally it can be taught in schools, right? Because because the idea is super simple. You just start executing instructions one by one, and then you end. You either fail or you just successfully finish the transaction. If it is a failure, you just roll back all of the changes. That's it. That's that's the the whole idea uh, behind EVM runtime. There might be an additional runtime that is more about of kind of more parallel execution or something like that, right? But like the, 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 there is no, from my point of view, there is no big problem in the EVM as as itself. In case we are talking about uh, synchronous runtimes, um, and uh, yeah, so the amount of runtimes, uh, I I believe or like my point of view for the future, it's going to be limited. So maybe, maybe it's, like it, it's worth waiting a little bit for us and check out which runtimes are uh, getting more developers uh, and then just, just support only these runtimes. Yeah, also when it moves in from proof of work to proof of stake system, it's gonna change a lot of this stuff too because a lot of the limitations that people would have why they want to do is the speed uh, and gas fees you know, that you get from Ethereum. So when proof of stake is there, it's, if it's a lot faster, it's going you know, to solve one of those problems too. So that's something to consider. Yeah, that, that's what everybody's here to solve is that, you know, getting everything connected. So market, market EVMOS and um, who knows, maybe you can overtake EVM at some point in time. It's going to be hard, but if you are a true believer, you need to do it. Okay, okay, let's, let's move it to networking session. Okay, and we're actually kind of finishing right now. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thanks for all the partners. Thanks for all the sponsors. Special thanks to Nadia from Debridge. Who is she? Where is she? <laughs> she has a birthday today so the first thought is going to be for her birthday i'm not sure if she's listening to me but huge thanks to nadia and huge thanks to uh debridge halborn and gnosis chain and aurora of course and uh, this meetup was brought to you by cyber academy you can watch all of this video at our youtube channel and uh, yes just wait for the news about the next meetup probably in berlin so see you there guys thank you And of course, upstairs is a lot of drinks and some food, so feel free to grab some. Thank you for coming. <laughs>